All right, welcome back, folks. Afternoon drive here. Hope everybody's doing well. Live from Drew's house. Hope you're all enjoying the fall. Can you believe we're getting to the end of October? Where did it go? Halloween candy starting to show up at my house. That's surprising to me and not good. I have a sweet tooth. Uh, anyways, we'll move right along here. Uh, get to my guest. Uh, Mike Allard is the Chief Operating Officer of Home Base. You may recognize him. I recognized him. He's been on Nesson before during Red Sox games and all that good stuff. First time on this show, though. Mike, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Drew. Uh, great to talk to you today. You do so much great work for veterans. Um, and actually, I, why don't we just start there? Tell us a little bit about the organization as a whole, too, because uh, for people that don't know what you guys do, uh, you do great work for veterans. Uh, well, thanks. Well, it's, it's, it's really great to talk with you and, and the audience today. And, and home base um, is uh, one of the special uh, places that we have here in the Boston area. Um, but, but it's a real gem that are serving veterans and their family members from all over the United States. And it's got a great origin story, um, and it really starts with the Boston Red Sox. Um, you know, back in uh, 2007, when, when we had achieved glory uh, for a second time uh, in that decade, um, the Red Sox, uh, as a champion team, uh, went down to, Walt, uh, to the White House uh, to greet then President Bush, as every champion team does. And uh, it was during that visit, uh, after uh, the photo and, and um, uh, celebration with the president, that the owners and the team and the manager went to Walter Reed. And, and if you think back to that period of time, so this was uh, spring training of 2008, you know, that was the height of the surge uh, in, in terms of our troops going over uh, to Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, to uh, be able to do the uh, important work that they were doing over there. And in unprecedented numbers, we were seeing um, our service members uh, being killed in action and being injured in ways that we hadn't seen in decades. And so um, if you've ever been to Walter Reed, it, it is uh, an experience that you'll never forget. And, and that was the case with everybody who went there, but particularly with the ownership and, and particularly Tom Warner. And at the time, um, the owners had been talking about what they wanted to do, not that they achieved with their goals on the field. How did they want to leave a legacy off of the field? And, um, you know, they were very mindful that back in the 1940s, uh, when the uh, ownership of the Sox was with the Yockeys, that they teamed up with Ted Williams to start the Jimmy Fund. And, of course, the Jimmy Fund has gone on to do just amazing work in the, in the realm of cancer. So they knew um, that after talking with these, these soldiers, airmen, Marines, and, and seamen, that um, they knew they had to contribute to veterans coming out, and that was gonna be a part of their legacy. So um, the one thing that they didn't know was what, what it was gonna be. And, and quickly, after many conversations with leadership in the military, and, and frankly, with those uh, veterans and service members on the ground, they realized that the invisible wounds of war uh, was the one issue that was facing our service members and veterans and families that nobody could get their hands around. And so it was at that point that they approached Mass General Hospital, which is the number one psychiatry uh, department in the country and following rehab and our physical medicine rehab partners did brain injury, which is ranked number two, that we formed Home Base, which um, was really unique in that we were the first and, and have become the largest private sector program in the country that's dedicated to healing the invisible wounds of war for our veterans and family members. And we do so all at no cost to them uh, because we operate on philanthropy and on a grateful nation, we're able to provide some pretty novel and innovative medical uh, clinical programs um, without regard to their ability to pay. Hmm. So it was really, uh, the ownership didn't exactly know, what, they wanted to do something, they knew that, but they didn't exactly know what they wanted to do and it, it just kind of struck them in that moment. Yeah, yeah, and and, uh, and 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 so I think you know, with a few good ideas and and a, and a strong will, you can make incredible things happen. And and I think, you know, back then and unfortunately it continues today. One of the things that they heard was that um, every day there are uh, back then it was 22, now it is 20 mm -hmm. veterans die by suicide every day, and and one active duty service. And, and unfortunately, one of the things that we know about the invisible wounds is that it's one of the most tre treatable sets of conditions that are out there. But if you don't get after it, it be can become deadly. And so, you know, we worry a lot these days about our, our, our veterans and service members because in these COVID times, as much as all of us are struggling with mental health, um, it, it's, it's beginning to take its toll. Um, our active duty 
uh, reported by the DOD just last week, uh, suicides are up by 20%. And there's a particular worry, which is pertinent to, to New England uh, for our reserve and guard members who are being called upon to do things uh, in ways that they've uh, trained, been trained to do, but uh, it's been very difficult uh, being able to be a part of these deployments uh, in COVID, uh, being able to try and help augment uh, different um, challenges that we've had um, within the, the, you know, the burgeoning um, uh, protests that have happened. And, and it causes a lot of challenges for them uh, to be able to um, you know, maintain equilibrium in their lives. And of course, here in Massachusetts, we've had the horrible incident in the, you know, the Holyoke Surgeon's Home, which were so many veterans, um, it, it, which is still a story that is in the news with, uh, obviously, things weren't handled well there. But uh, I know that must have hit home with you and within that community, because let's face it, veterans look out for veterans, and that must be a real uh, tough sting on, on that community right now. Yeah, that, that, that was incredibly hard, and I've had um, the real... Uh, pleasure and honor of going out to the soldiers' home uh, out west, and and you know those those um, those uh, heroes, you know, um, have sacrificed an incredible amount, um, and it it definitely was one of the most deadly impacts on COVID. And that's certainly not what we want for any of our our veterans um, uh, to see that as the end of their life. So, um, you know, they're in good hands uh, now, uh, and and they're. Folks are getting treated, but that was that was an awful situation. You know, I don't think is there still a level. Um, you mentioned that that number of um, suicides there for a lot of people. If I didn't do an interview recently with a veteran, that number would, you know, make my jaw drop. But uh, it did that day. The number of veteran suicides on just a daily basis. It's 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 almost. Uh, I don't want to say underreported, but it's almost. I, I I couldn't believe it when I heard it. I mean, it's a staggering number. Um, and almost something that people really do need to be told about more, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quiet crisis that I think um, uh, most of our communities don't fully appreciate or understand. Um, you know, you know there, there are, um, when you dig down into it and, and you look at um, nearly 20 years of, of conflict, sustained conflict that our country has been in, um, you can begin to understand that that takes an incredible toll on those who, and frankly, in the first time of our country's history, have been an all-volunteer force. So every single member of our armed forces have, have raised their hand. There's no conscription. And I think many people um, who are even in the military agree that that's, that's still a good thing that we have a non-conscripted environment. But it does mean that the burden of service is relying on much fewer people. And uh, the nature of these conflicts on the war on terror means that um, there is an incredible amount of deployments that occur uh, during one service period of time. And we've relied on the Guard and Reserve components in ways that we've never done so in, in, our, in our country's history. So you can imagine, you know, when all of us maybe go on a business trip and it, maybe it goes three or four days or five days and the pressure that that puts on the family, um, you know, try imagining in the early parts of the war, it was 18 months. Um, and then maybe you had a year back and then you went back for it. Um, that, that takes an incredible toll for anyone. And, you know, for our, our, our service members, you know, there's a built-in resilience to become a service. You know, you, you have to qualify to get into it. So they are amongst the most resilient people that you'll, you'll know. But at the same time, and as much as we train our service members uh, the, uh, the best out of any country that does in the world, what is difficult is we don't really have a good formula for training them to come back into the civilian sector. And, and that's where, you know, I think, you know, our government is doing a lot, uh, but um, that's where we in the private sector really need to, to pick up the ball and, and help with this and really the founding principles of home base. That same veteran I was uh, talking about earlier, and again, we're joined by Mike Allard, home base through the Red Sox Foundation. They do so much for veterans uh, all across Massachusetts. Uh, that veteran that I was talking about is, uh, you may have know, know him actually, his name's William Shuttleworth, and he walked across the country this year uh, trying to raise money uh, for just veterans awareness. And uh, he said he would just talk to people too, and he had a lot of young people asking, uh, 
you know, what's it like to, to be a veteran and who have you talked to that have struggled? And, um, and then that was his goal was to raise money for, for, uh, to get awareness of put money into veterans issues. But another thing he told me, and it's interesting being in election season is that he would love to see more veterans run for political positions, not just here, but all across the country. Um, I wonder just from your perspective, being in this community, uh, are there enough people out there fighting for veterans rights? Yeah, I, 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 I don't think there are. And, uh, you know, I, I, I remember watching William's progress uh, uh, every time you'd go into Changing Tides Donut and Coffee Shop, you know, they, they'd have that pin marker on, on the map. And, and that was such an incredible feat for, for anyone, but particularly for, for him. Um, and he, he told me it was not, it's not as impressive as impressive as you think. He goes, what do you do? You go to work this morning, right? That's what I did. I just walked a little and then I stopped and walked a little more and you do that every day. And at the end, eventually you get there. He made it seem very, uh, I don't know, whatever that is. <laughs> well, if that's not the ethos of a ethos of a veteran, I don't know what is you know, exactly. so just doing his, doing his thing, uh, or in many cases for our veterans doing their job. You know, I, I think, um, you, we are, we're, we're losing a generation of what it means to understand service. And, and I think when you look back on World War II, you know, those who came out of World War II, of course, it, it affected so many in our country. And inevitably, they went on to become community leaders, business leaders, academic leaders, and of course, political leaders. Um, you know, today, less than half of a percent of, of our uh, age eligible population is serving. Uh, and you compare that to World War II numbers where, of course, the numbers were upwards of about 20 percent. You know, what, what you see is that lessons of service um, and, and, you know, serving in the military is one way, but there's, of course, lots of different ways. But, but it is being lost on, on a generation. And, and I think, you know, when, when William talks about that, I think uh, at its core, that's probably what he's getting to because, there, there is a sense of duty, um, and it is not easy to be in politics as we know these days, uh, but there's also a certain sense of obligation and sacrifice that comes along with it uh, to make choices and, and decisions for your personal and professional life that are going to benefit the community, community members around you. Mm. I wonder, um, you know, you mentioned the, the Red Sox organization getting behind. And let me just touch on that one more second. I, I don't want to make this completely about the ownership, but uh, I was thinking about this. I have very spoiled younger cousins as we lighten the mood a little bit I, uh, that only know championships around here. Uh, they, don't, they don't even remember Aaron Boone hitting the home run. To, you know, I, feel like that's when, I feel like that's when I earned my stripes. You know? and my uncles looked at me and said, now you get it. Um, but they, they only know championships. and they, you know, They're upset with the trade of Mookie and how could the ownership do this? Enough of these guys. And I kind of look at them and say, boys, this is the ownership that has brought three world championships here. And, I, you know, it's a, they're spoiled. That's the end of that. But I, I do, from a greater perspective, you talk about this legacy and how that was important to them. Uh, they did have a lot more on the minds than just baseball. I know Red Sox was the big thing, but, but they did so much to the ballpark and the city. And they, tell me a little bit about this ownership that people don't know and don't hear when they tune into, you know, normal sports talk radio. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, they, uh, they, they've done some very innovative things uh, when it comes to, you just think about Major League Baseball team. Of course, one of the things that they, they did right out the bat when they bought the team is they, they established a foundation. You know, previously, of course, the Red Sox were very generous, but they, they, in establishing the Red Sox Foundation, they got really serious about their, their overall philanthropic giving. And, and to do that, took some foresight, and I can tell you others in Major League Baseball have followed suit in, in doing so. And, and, you know, they've really been able to carve out some important themes in terms of, you know, for home base, it's veterans, but also youth scholarships and, and um, you know, their support of the Jimmy Fund and, and also support in the fight against domestic violence. You know, there are important themes that resonate with that, that ownership group. Um, I, I think like many things, when you, when you look at giving back, it's, it's personal. And, and I think what people don't realize is that um, Tom Werner in particular, his father uh, served in World War II and, and was part of military intelligence. And Tom talks about this when he's asked, but you know, you know, it's something that I think our viewers don't really recognize or understand 
that uh, it's personal. Um, and, and so when you see your parent who serves and, and appreciate you know, what that meant, um, it stays with you for a long time. And, um, and I know that's true of all of the, the owners, but I think particularly for, for Tom and, and uh, David Ginsburg, who's, who's also been very involved, uh, whose father was a prisoner of war uh, at Ofuna in Japan, uh, which was the same place that Louis Zamperini, uh, which was, who was featured in Unbroken, uh, was also a prisoner of war there. And, and so, you know, um, you know, those types of experiences in their personal lives have influenced them to wanting to make sure that, you know, what they may have seen as challenges uh, within their families, you know, can be uh, as um, our next generation of veterans have needs. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I, you know, I wonder too, and this is kind of uh, a little bit off the grid. I tend to bounce around a little bit because that's the great thing about having free form shows. But um, you mentioned the protest a little bit earlier. You're already in a pandemic. Talk about the news that 2020 has brought. It seems like a new, new story every week, really, um, and mostly not good, unfortunately. But uh, it's been a kind of a crazy year in that regard. We had the in my town, we had a and still have a thin blue line controversy going along with the, uh, you know, the police departments and the the thin blue line flags were taken off the fire trucks and. Uh, so many of the police and firefighters I know are veterans themselves uh, are military service. And um, it's, it's interesting to, I'm curious, I've been trying to get a feel for, and I've, I've talked to a lot of veterans about that controversy in particular. And I think a lot of people initially jumped to the fact that they must hate anything that has to do with the flag being disrespected and throw it away. Not necessarily true. A lot of veterans I've talked to, including one I just bumped into at uh, Singing Beach yesterday, um, gave me that common line of that's what we fight for. We fight for so people can have freedom of speech. That's the whole point. And I think it's such a admirable answer um, from veterans. And it, it is true, so true when you think about it, but it's such an admirable answer to, you know, have these things going on on the streets of maybe your hometown, Boston, certainly all these protests and have these veterans go, that's exactly what we fought for. And now let's get it right. You know, and I, I just your take on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's certainly an understand statement to say that we, we have been in such um, in incredibly difficult times that nobody's faced in in you know our lifetime. Um, and and you know, I think what what that veteran said in terms of you know everyone who raises their right hand is fighting for our country's principles. Um, and you know, people will will be on different sides of you know the the various debates that pop up about things like uh, flags and, and those sorts of things. But at, it, at their core, they believe in our country's principles. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's where, from a home-based perspective, what, what we worry about, you know, we don't get involved in whether, um, you know, this side of the discussion or, or, or the other. But what we do know is it is causing a tremendous amount of strain um, on, on everyone and I think also our, our, our veterans and those first responders, whether you're a veteran or, or not, um, you know, they have had to respond to so much. Um, and it would, COVID alone would have been challenging, uh, to, to say the least. But, um, you know, I, I think a mix of these things, um, you know, one of the things we worry about is this uh, potential tsunami of, of overall well being that, you know, we're all kind of just living through this. Um, but, um, you know, it's going to come to roost at some point. And, and I think when you say this, when you say the stress, do you mean just even like just watching the coverage? I mean, because I can imagine that being a stressful thing in general, just watching it on the news. I can see that being a, a tough thing to see. Yeah, I, I think it's watching it, but I also think it's living it too. So, you know, when, you know, our firefighters are, are, are often EMTs as well, or, yeah. you know, they're, they're responding to, um, you know, situations over the past six months that, much, much like all of us, you know, there's a lot of questions and, and a lot of learnings that we've had. You know, one of, one of the things that um, myself and our executive director, uh, General Jack Hammond, and, and 50 of our staff members at home base, uh, we were asked by Governor Baker uh, back at the end of March to uh, come in and help stand up the field hospital, uh, which we call Boston Hope, at the um, Boston Convention Center, which was a thousand bed uh, COVID positive field hospital. Uh, it was a great mission and, and it was really indicative of so many pla 
people and places coming together from across our region to respond to uh, an emergency. But we got a chance um, to see firsthand what um, our community, uh, and many of whom were veterans, can do when um, called upon. And, and you know, we got the call on March 31st, and we had uh, about 10 days to stand it up. And, and in those 10 days, we were able to assemble this world-class medical team, 1,000 employees, and, and get it up and running so that we could welcome our first patients in. And I think, you know, when we often hear about these challenges and, and, and issues that are very, very important, sometimes what we lose is the fact that we're doing some pretty incredible things as civilians, but also as veterans, um, and, and, you know, kind of celebrate those elements as well. But uh, to bring it full circle, what we do know is in working with our, our first responder communities, you know, it, it was the wild west when it came to COVID. You know, people were crashing, they're going into hospitals, there's transports, lots of confusion. And um, over that long a period of time to live it, it puts an incredible stress uh, on, on those folks. I remember watching that uh, hospital go up and this, oh, they're gonna put it right there, okay. And then like a couple days later, we all said, well, okay, that's how it's done, I guess. Yeah, <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was an amazing effort. And, you know, the folks at uh, BCEC were, were incredible. I mean, it, it actually was a great site um, yeah. to, to be able to establish. But, uh, there are a lot of good stories, too, to come out of this pandemic of uh, real good community, people helping people, I think. I, uh, when this is all said and done, I think those stories will come to light even more. Um, we just hope we get out of it uh, faster, uh, well, as fast as we possibly can. On a personal level, Mike, how is uh, the family doing okay? Have we uh, been getting through it all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, um, you know, we're, we're all doing great. Uh, you know, up here in Newburyport, I've got four kids. And so uh, three, three in high school, one who's, um, you know, spending our her semester uh, here uh, away from the University of South Carolina, but she'll be going back. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're like many others where we're just, um, we're looking forward to better days. Um, you know, but we're, we're finding ways in which we can, you know, kind of make it, um, still exciting and real. Uh, this weekend, and one thing I wanted to mention to you is um, home base kind of, uh, we never lost uh, our, our pace in terms of delivering uh, healthcare out, you know, to our outpatients uh, when COVID came about. And so we've done telehealth. Uh, we operate a two week intensive program uh, that serves veterans from all over the country who come in to, to this unbelievable model where we compress about two years worth of treatment into two weeks uh, for both post-traumatic stress as well as traumatic brain injury. And, and it has been incredibly successful. So um, that is back up and running. And uh, one of the things that I've been occupying my time with uh, since I've been back from Boston Hope is uh, training for the virtual Marine Corps Marathon. And so this weekend, I'm gonna be uh, out on the streets of Newburyport, uh, logging in 26.2 miles to, to be able to raise some support for for home base so that we can keep those uh, clinical services going for our folks. Good, good for you, sir. We will uh, we'll hit the horn when we drive by you. I don't, <laughs> it's a good weight management program, I can tell you that. <laughs> I bet it is. What a, uh, it is. It's a great city, isn't it, Newburyport? I, uh, I, like I said, you know, I, I live in Danvers, but I've, uh, I kind of treated it as a, my, an adopted home, working out of there for these last few years. And I mean, my wife and I, we bring the dogs who you probably actually hear a little bit. He seems to be barking a lot. I left them outside today, but um, they're out there barking. But uh, we bring the dogs up, walk around the great trails, great walking city in general, a great spot to see a, a live music or whatever. It's just a great, great city, Newburyport. I love it. Yeah, it, it really is. It's, it's such a, it's a great place. Um, you know, uh, you know, very strong veteran support community. Uh, many people may be familiar with the uh, First Lieutenant Derek Hines uh, Fund, which uh, uh, the Hines family is one of the most um, unbelievable families you meet, Gold Star family that has raised incredible support in this community to help veterans and their family members. And then, of course, um, I think you may know our friend Dick George, who's 101st Airborne uh, Massachusetts chapter and and Dick's, uh, you know, he, he has more energy than I could ever hope for. He is one of the best. And he's one of our luminaries here in, in Newburyport. And it's such a great, you talk about people helping people, community coming together. I mean, 
I remember one of my favorite moments, one of my early resume, uh, first things on my resume is that uh, I, I take a lot of pride in it. The voice of Newburyport Clippers uh, hockey back in the day for uh, yeah. the, when we used to cover all the, all the games in there. But one of the things I, I learned, that's kind of how I started to learn so much about Newburyport and the tight knit community was uh, that Derek Hines game and the game that's, that's dedicated to him. And um, that was, that was no joking matter. Those players and those coaches took that very seriously, whether it be the uniforms that were designed in tribute to him or just that game in general, always played with a lot of pride. Um, you know, it was Newburyport for the, the prep, obviously, but uh, that, that game is just uh, played with a lot of passion. And I just remember thinking, I was like, what a cool thing for, for a city to, to do for, for one of the, you know, people that put their life on the line and eventually lost it. Uh, I've always thought it's a, a great tribute. And it was one of the first things I saw as a Newburyport, uh, traveling with the Newburyport hockey team. Yeah, 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 it is, it is special. And, you know, um, in the midst of, of devastating loss and tragedy, that family has done so good in, in Derek's memory and, and honor. And that was before I, I really became connected with the community. What, what was that? Were you living in Newburyport during that? I was, yeah, yeah. It must yeah. have really torn apart the, uh, not torn apart, but, but really just, it must have been a tough place to, to be during all that. Yeah, you know, I, um, I've been in Newburyport for 19 years, and so I um, had not um, met the Hines at that point when, when Derek was, was killed, but um, I, I have a story which I, I tell, which is emblematic of um, who the Heinz family is. Um, about a year later, um, I was running um, my second marathon actually, and on behalf of uh, one of my son's um, childhood friends, um, he was five at the time, and his friend Liberty, uh, uh, Wyatt and Liberty, um, had uh, cancer, was being treated at Mass General. So I was running the marathon on behalf of Liberty, and so raising money for that. And um, this uh, woman came down the street to where we were living, and she said, you know, um, my wife had thrown a, a little bit of a, a, a party, and she said, you know, I saw in the newspaper that you were doing this, and, you know, my name's Sue Hines, and I just want to let you know that this community came out for my family in our time of need. And I see what you're doing, and we just wanted to contribute to what you're trying to do. I didn't know her. Um, you know, she saw something and just walked down. And, and for me, uh, that, that's given back as a community, and, and, and certainly with Sue and Steve and, and, and Trevor and the whole family, you know, they, um, they, they really embody that. Mm, absolutely. Well, that's a great story. I'm glad we got there and you were able to tell that. Um, uh, I'm sure, yeah, it's a loss you never get over, but um, obviously a lot of uh, uh, good is, is happening in the years after. So uh, in, interesting. Well, the, uh, what would be your final, if you had to make one point, what is the thing that the message that veterans want the common person, the average, average person on the street, I'm 30, say 20 to 30, thing that 20 to 30 year olds, high school kids, I don't know. What's, what's the thing that the younger generation doesn't know, doesn't get about veterans? Hmm. I, I, I think the, um, the, the, the common thing, that's a great question, Drew. I, I think the common thing that, that most who aren't, don't have a degree of separation uh, attached to it, don't understand is that um, there are literally millions of, of young men and women and, and, and older men and women who are serving um, and, and doing so in, in a way in which it, it's become a little less visible in this day and age. And, and the understanding of the sacrifice that they made uh, and continue to make uh, on behalf of the country, um, you know, thankfully it is appreciated. I think in our communities it's appreciated, but I don't think it's as understood. And, and so, you know, I, I think uh, the best thing that our folks can do is just um, not only say thank you for your service, and, and I think we, we all tend to do that, um, but, but it's really to begin to, to kind of ask about what they did in the military. And, and then, you know, get a higher level of awareness that um, these men and women predominantly by and far, they are very, very successful in life. And, and so, um, we need to make sure that we're careful to, to know that um, that really truly is the image of a veteran or family member. But like any of us would be uh, in need of, um, 
there is support out there that they'll need when they come back home. Um, you know, if any of us went away for a year or two and came back in after seeing conflict uh, or being away from family, um, we would need help. And so, you know, help is out there, but it's less understood about how do you get to it. And so one of the things I appreciate is just you giving me an opportunity to talk about home base. Um, you know, it's uh, one of those uh, great efforts in our communities here that are that can help provide a gap and, and, and provide world class treatment uh, at no cost, uh, thanks to, you know, basically a grateful nation that, that does care. And, uh, and so that's the most important thing uh, I would say. And and let's let's face it. I do think there's a a thing amongst veterans. There's a, a, obviously a, a huge sense of pride, and sometimes veterans uh, they don't necessarily like to talk about a lot of these things. And I know that's an issue that uh, that community has dealt with within itself a little bit too. Um, right, right, yeah, it, it's true. It's true. You know, mental health overall, or or any of our health conditions, are such that um, you know we don't we don't want to talk about it. It's that's even more so in the veteran community. And one of the things we, we made sure we have, we've got, um, you know, uh, about uh, at least a third of our staff are, are combat veterans. And one of the things that a veteran will find when they, when they are just seeking any type of service between clinical care or we do a whole bunch of things with fitness and, and nutrition um, is that they're going to talk to a fellow veteran of any service branch, male or female, when they call us. And that's important because they need to know that there's somebody on the other line that's got while not perhaps the same experience, a shared experience. Veterans helping veterans too, that's great. The, um, I, I'm, I'm sure you've heard all sorts of great stories along the years from uh, some of these veterans have, you know, as, as much as it's a sometimes terrible service that they're doing and sometimes it's uh, really tough environments that they've gone into. Uh, there's, there's some really great stories. Sometimes there's funny stories that come out of <laughs> service too. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure you've heard it all. Um, one of my, one of my, uh, favorite Mark Bishop, Bishop Evans, who's a, uh, a guest on the show and has been on many times, uh, served in Vietnam. And he said, you know, one of the humorous things is drew about Vietnam. He said, I used to, uh, I don't think I got shot at, uh, I got shot at more with my guitar than I did with my guns because he was a guitar player and they had made him into like a trio of, uh, of like a, they would play and go to the base camps. And long story short, they, you know, became popular and the troops were liking these little shows. So he said, I had to put down my gun. I get my guitar. They would fly you from camp to camp. And I'm flying so much that we're being shot at all the time. And I said, this guitar is very dangerous. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I thought that story was great. But uh, and we just stumbled upon it. That's why I love doing these shows. But uh, I thank you for all your work that you do for the veterans. Um, and uh, obviously we've had a, a, a nice relationship with the, um, some of them. I'd love, love to have more as well. It's an open invite to anybody who wants to come on, uh, especially here in the Newburyport area, but from anywhere. Um, do you mind doing a quick little, uh, we'd like to meet our guests on a kind of a light personal level to go out. Do you mind doing a quick rapid fire? Yeah, sure. All right. Favorite musician? Oh, shoot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> favorite musician? Um, Go to the next one. I'm going to come back to that. Favorite movie? Favorite movie? Oh, I'd, I'd have to say the. Yeah, I'm I'm a kid of the '70s and '80s, so I've got a I've got to group it all in there with Star Wars. Star Wars, okay. very good. Uh, favorite quarantine activity? Favorite quarantine activity? Um, you know what? Uh, you know. Cooking over an open fire with my kids. Yeah, we are getting, we are getting a lot of cooking through this. It's it's like a five shows in a row now. I think I've had cooking as that answer. It's crazy. Huh. I need to start cooking more. Yeah, yeah. You, it's, you said it's over an open good. fire. Is that what you said? Over an open, open fire. fire. Yep, yep. Cooking over an open fire. Okay. What's the favorite meal? Um. So the the favorite meal is actually so so the reason I uh, there's a. Uh, we're all familiar with Chef's Table. So there's an Ar Argentinian chef who, who specializes in cooking over open fire. And my daughter, my youngest, is our chef. So she and I get into it. And so um, we prepare a, a, a either a steak or a combination of steak and lamb over it. That, that um, It takes a little while, but if you do it right and down to the coals, um, it's incredibly rewarding. So And bonding with the daughter. You can't beat that, right? Right, right, 
Did you come up with favorite uh, favorite musician? Yet? I, I did, and, and I'm going to throw you a curveball. It's actually two, okay. uh, and, and it's a it's an unusual combination. But Sting and Shaggy, um, and you oh. may know that they put out a record a little while ago. And uh, you know, for for very you know kind of interesting, two very different styles. But when you blend those two guys together, it, it's it's amazing. Um, yeah. And uh, I I, I um, part of it is I followed their music over many many years, but. Um, in the course of the past year, each one of them um, uh, uh, performed for home base, and uh, and not many people know this, but Shaggy is a Marine, um, so he he served uh, I think for at least uh, four, if not six years, and um, and he's got a great story because he says, um, you know, I uh, uh, he said he loved being a Marine, but he but he kept uh, getting in trouble because on his off hours he would go from uh, North Carolina up to New York to perform and he was perpetually late and coming back. <laughs> wow. That is a great story. And when you deal with the, and I did not know he was a Marine. That's, that's fascinating. Um, when you deal with those celebrities too, cause I know you do have a lot of that. There's a big aspect of, of, uh, they, they, they tend to pay tribute to the veterans and do what they can. Um, and usually those people that do that sort of stuff and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they're usually not in it for the show or the publicity. They're in there because they want to be there and it, it's what they want to be doing. Yep. Yeah, it, it is. It, it really is. And, you know, um, there's usually a, a connection, right? So, you know, one of their, either themselves in the case of Shaggy or a family member has served. And, um, you know, it, it's something that, you know, it, it's, it's not as well known. We had um, Harry Connick Jr. Uh, play for us at an annual gala a number of years ago. And, you know, one of the things that nobody really knows is that his sister has been in the army for all of her career. Wow. Um, and uh, and for, for him, it was personal. Um, and so, you know, you, you hear about, you know, all these exorbitant fees that, that folks uh, charge around this stuff. And we, we, don't, we don't go for that. You know, we rest on philanthropy. We want people who really care about these issues to, to hopefully get out the message and spread the word. Ever a celebrity that you got to like meet and you said, uh, I would not have guessed that you would have, uh, not that I thought you were a bad person, but I wouldn't have guessed you would have been here doing this. Um, that's a good question. Um, I've got one, but I don't know if I want to divulge it because it's not a good story. <laughs> oh, well, well, as much as I want you to, I'm not going to force you to do anything. <laughs> Maybe offline over a beer sometime. All right, sounds like a plan. Um, and lastly, what is it? What is the relationship with the Red Sox meant to you personally? Obviously, home base and Red Sox go hand in hand. But uh, what what is it meant to you personally? Yeah, so you know, I, I grew up. I grew up in New England, right? I grew up on by Buzzard Bay and in uh, Newburyport, and and so the Red Sox is is in, in my DNA. Um, you know, I think for me, it, it's been great to work with a group of owners and, and leadership of the Red Sox that, um, you know, really do care uh, as much as we like to criticize what's going on in the field. You know, they've done a lot for this community. And, and it's been a privilege to be able to help be a part of that um, when we did this. You know, for me personally, you know, um, I, I do this work because I had a family member who unfortunately took his own life and uh, because of these types of conditions. And, and so, you know, um, I love working with the Red Sox. I love Mass General Hospital. Uh, but like those other stories you mentioned, you know, we're doing it because we can see the devastating effect it has on families and um, we as a nation can do better. And so that, that's what's in it for me. All right. Well, I think we'll leave it at that. I will let you uh, get back to the nice Newburyport, New England fall weather. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Mike Allard, uh, Home Base. They, uh, great work with veterans that you do. Uh, and if you want to learn more, where can people find more information? You want to give a web page? Or, uh, yeah, uh, homebase.org. Homebase.org. There you go. Mike, thank you so much for the time today, man. I really enjoyed it. All right, Drew. Great talking with you. Thank do you. Do it again sometime, all right? Sounds good. All right, Mike Allard, very good stuff there. Home Base. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I guess, well, wow, time got ahead of me. It kind of went a little long. As you all know, I always say that usually means I am enjoying the conversation when they go long, which is the benefit of doing this show from your kitchen. I don't have anybody yelling at me about commercials or anything, so here we go. Uh, good way to start the week. Mike Allard right there. Thank you, sir. Uh, great stuff there on veterans, and they do a lot of great work. 
that organization for veterans. Uh, just ask around. You can hear plenty of stories. So uh, very good. We'll see you next time. Live from Drew's house. Thanks, everybody.